You don't need to train to failure, but there are situations in which doing so is smart. And right now, I'll be discussing those nuances, starting with novice lifters. I would state that leaving a rep or two in the tank is best for learning the proper movement patterns and dialing your form in for the long term. Less fatigue equals less form degradation. Not to mention the fact that from a gain standpoint, it's pretty much equivalent provided that your proximity to failure is close. And that range appears to be one to three reps in reserve for optimal results. And so the truth is, you can acquire all your newbie gains without having ultimate grinders or killing yourself in the gym, at least in a perfect world. The problem, and it really is a big issue, is that most novices don't train hard even if you tell them to. What I mean is, they greatly overestimate their perceived efforts. They think they went to failure, but oftentimes they got many reps left in the tank. Or they think they only have one more, but they have two or three more. And interestingly enough, there is research to confirm this. In most cases, guys have way more left inside of them. Now the thing is, coaches can get mad at these first year lifters. It's not their fault. They just got started. Instead, we have to get them in the trenches, make them feel what it's like to really strain before we can dial things back. Which leaves us to the original topic of this video, training to failure. Although I do not recommend going to all out muscular failure on every single set, that prescription might be smart for someone who really struggles to train hard, which a lot of old school guys and even the OGs from 10 years ago on YouTube Fitness didn't have a problem with because back then nobody was talking about RPE. So I would say go to failure on the majority of your sets, even though that's not what I recommend at all. Because what's interesting is that even though a lot of your sets will be to failure, on average, you're usually gonna have a rep or two left in the tank, which leaves you in that optimal zone of effective reps with less fatigue. Not that you really have to worry about fatigue in the first place though, because another thing that novices stress about is the stimulus to fatigue ratio. Everybody wants the best exercises. It's gotta be biomechanically sound, easiest on the joints, recovery, getting more or less weight, all the things that I preach 24 seven because it's super important. But the thing is, if you got no muscle, where's this fatigue coming from? If you're only benching a plate, where's the fatigue? Like you can literally go to all out muscular failure, and then do triple drop sets and have a bro push up on the barbell and say, yeah, it's all you and still recover fine. That's how little fatigue you generate because of the absolute load. You see what I'm saying? So that's another pro of going to failure right now. It's just not gonna affect you to the same extent that it would an advanced lifter. So what you typically see is complete beginners either going to failure or leaving a rep in the tank, and then as they get stronger, it becomes one to two reps in the tank, and then eventually two to three. And then towards the end of their mesocycle, the intensity climbs a little bit. So they're back to that one to two zone and some sets are taking a failure. That's the natural evolution of how this plays out. So if you're struggling with perceived effort, going to failure is a guaranteed way of going because we know that if you can't move a weight anymore, that maximum hypertrophy was stimulated for that set. It's impossible to second guess it which indicates that if you're failing to grow despite hitting real failure, then your program has to be garbage or your nutrition and sleep is off. Simple as that. This is how you strip it down. All the f mental masturbation, bare bones, this is what it is. Just train harder. Secondly, let's talk about isolation movements. I don't care if you're a beginner or elite, you can go to failure on these. Let's keep it real. They are not particularly hard on recovery. If you mean to tell me that doing dumbbell curls to failure is ruining your workouts, that's why you can't do rows, pull-ups, or deadlifts anymore. It was the elbow flexion with 35 pounds that f***ed you over. Then I'm sorry, there's something seriously wrong. Or it's all in your head or you're just making up excuses. Same thing for tricep pushdowns. 
that's sabotaging your ability to close your bench or do dips, come on, give me a break. Face pulls, you can go to failure on those. Leg extensions, leg curls, flies, especially with cables, when you're squeezing to the max. Basically, even if it is true that leaving a rep in the tank is practically the same for gaining mass, it doesn't matter when we talk about isolation movements because the fatigue is already so low that you might as well go all out just for the sake of not overcomplicating your training and ensuring that you're actually training hard enough, particularly for those weak links, because that's what we isolate for in most cases. These are easy exercises in the sense that they don't beat you up. When you record yourself, it might look like the really brutal sets when you're making these faces and you're trying to get that final rep of your curls, but let's keep it real. Three sets of 10 on a barbell back squat with three reps in reserve is way more challenging then five sets of 10 dumbbell curls done to failure. Yet the second example has more volume and relative intensity per set. But you have to factor in axial loading and the fact that with compound movements, it's many muscles at the same time coordinating and simultaneously getting fatigued. So the net effect of fatigue is higher, which also explains the usability of supersets. It's always gonna come naturally on isolation movements you don't need as much work capacity to pull it off, whereas compounds will gas you out. You are huffing and puffing, plus you need the maximum rest time. So if the range is three to five, which is what the literature demonstrates to be optimal, on a curl, you might stop at three minutes. Actually, some you might do too, just because you don't want to be in the gym that long for a simple movement like that, right? But you'll do three on an isolation, five on a brutal compound, even though the intensity was the same quote unquote. And so for the sake of simplicity, practicality, and the fact that there's really no downsides to going to failure on these motions, you might as well just do it. Thirdly, let's talk about strength curves and how that plays a role in training to failure. I'd say that whenever a resistance profile is most difficult at the end of the range of motion, the more you probably should go to failure on those movements for one simple reason. Your muscles are capable of a lot more work in the length in the range. But because you're biasing the end portion where you're supposed to be weaker, obviously the set is gonna stop right then and there. But had you use a different machine that reverse that setup, basically being harder at the start, easier at the end, what would happen is that if you try to do another rep, you wouldn't be able to move that limb at all. It'd be a very slight bend before you just stop. Whereas on these inverted resistance profiles, you can still get the weight moving, but only about 50%. And the greatest example I can give you is any free weight rows. You've probably noticed this, that as you get closer to failure, it's very difficult to bring the bar or the dumbbell to your chest. You easily get it at the midpoint, but it's that final squeeze that you just struggle with. Hence the birth of cheat rows. And you have to ask, why do so many elite bodybuilders, especially naturals, use cheat reps? Well, because the resistance profile is to begin with. So this is a compensation strategy because these rows are limited by end strength, but that's when your muscles are weaker. So besides cheat reps, a good way to extend your set is by doing partials in the bottom, lengthened partials, which is where you're going to grow most of your muscle to begin with. That is superior for hypertrophy. So when you stop because you can no longer touch your chest, you didn't actually fail per se. In a way, I would almost compare this to using a lower RPE because had you push those bottom repetitions, you would have gotten a few more and then would have stopped right then and there. So you're probably still getting gains because you're in those effective reps, but you would get more gains if your proximity to failure was even closer. So that's what I'm saying. I hope this is not too confusing for you guys. Another example would be the tricep pushdown. If you stand really far away from the cable, the direction of resistance will be diagonal such that when your arm is fully locked out, that's when the tension is highest. Now, because we're weaker in the shortened position, you might actually hit failure when you're standing further away from the cable. 
But what you would find 100% of the time is that if you took a few steps forward and now you're more upright and the cable is more vertical, you would get more reps in because now it's going to be slightly less difficult at the end range. So to sum up this point, when you're limited by your squeezing strength, consider doing mechanical drop sets. Not only is this efficient, because you're now going to hit the lengthen and shorten position simultaneously from one movement, it also ensures that you're getting the most growth out of that movement. By the way, this also applies to grindable lifts where you're equally straining throughout the entire range of motion. It doesn't appear to be any time in the joint angles where you feel like a drop off in strength. So like the deceleration curve is less. And so it's not this hit or miss type of lift where you're extremely explosive on one rep and then the next one, the pop is good, but you can't lock the weights out or you'll just be stapled in the bottom. So examples of this would be belt squats, which make it really easy to go to failure, much better than barbell back squats, by the way, because now it's pretty much the quads that become the limiting factor. And you're going to have those really slow reps at the end. Plus, you can use the handles to cheat yourself a bit. So whenever you have a little bit of assistance, that tends to help, as well as reverse bands, because the reverse band is essentially your spotter. So the whole point with this is you're overloading. The weight on the bar is heavier, but in the bottom, you're using your original straight weights. Just that once you start moving that load, the bands are going to start to pull you up, which pushes the deceleration curve higher. And therefore, you get more of a straining effect. You're forcing throughout more of the range of motion, hence being grindier. So that's what I mean by strength curves. If it's really poor or it generally emphasizes the shortened position, or you can grind your freaking life away, feel free to go to failure. It tends to be easier to do so. Fourthly, training to failure is smart when you have guaranteed safety measures in place. In other words, there is very little risk in pushing the set to the limit. You're not fearful of getting hurt or even worse, dying. Which might sound extreme on my part, but hear me out. If I were a lifting cat that did not bench press or squat with safety pins, I would have lost all my lives by now. There's equipment and people that can be there for you. But keep in mind, sometimes you can't even trust spotters. So double checking your setup is always the first line of defense because doing so will allow you to strain in a way that doesn't lead to garbage form. Because if you know that failure will lead to your demise, then what are you going to do to not fail? Use any means possible to succeed, which can lead to snap city or just you teaching yourself false movement patterns. So we've seen too many gym fail compilations with accidents that could have a hundred percent been prevented from the get go. That said, the good news is that there's a lot of exercises that naturally have a safety aspect in place. Like when using dumbbells, if you get stapled at the bottom of a press, you can just toss them back down on your knees or throw them to your sides, but please make sure that there's no one next to you. For deadlifts, you just gotta let go of the bar. It's gonna make some noise, but better that than snapping your back. And if you're gonna use straps, the regular ones are safer than figure eights, because with that, you're really locked into place. Then we got pull-ups where you just end up hanging and drop the feet down, followed by push-ups, to which you can really grind your life away. If you fail, you just end up on the floor and that's it. So if you're afraid of doing some select barbell movements because maybe you don't have the right setup in place, then either leave some reps in reserve because you never know what might go wrong, or if you misgauge your proximity to failure, or use movements that make it easy for you to fail and go beyond. Lastly, let's end off this video on the topic of volume and frequency. If you are running a body part split where each muscle is only being trained once a week, then obviously fatigue management becomes far less important because you're no longer stressing about the bleeding effect, how one upper body workout will affect the next one in 72 hours from now. In truth, it becomes a lot more important with higher frequency programs, in addition to lowering your percentages in general. Like there's a reason why people who 
train every single day are not going to all out 100%. They might cap their loads to 90%. And their percentage backdowns are never too grindy. They have repeatable technique with good force output, but it's not to the point where it's gonna affect them the next day because they gotta come in and do their squats or bench or whatever the fuck. So for very specific strength athletes or anyone who has a bare minimum of twice a week muscle protein synthesis, I would say that fatigue management is way more relevant. Finally, when we talk about volume, it should be noted that the lower you go, the more intense your training should be. So the weekly recommended range is 10 to 20 sets per body part. If you're at 10 or even below it, say getting six sets for your chest, then you might as well go to failure because let's keep it real, it's not gonna be that bad on your recovery. And you've already accepted the fact that hypertrophy results will not be optimal. So if you're running a subpar system to begin with, then you might as well get the most out of it, which kind of goes back to the heavy duty training philosophy that Mike Menzer popularized years ago, which a lot of stuff has been disproven in the modern age. And there's not many heavy hitters still train that way, but it will be a lie to state that it doesn't work or has not produced elite natural physiques. So if you resonate with that type of system, then go for it. It would typically involve having multiple exercises in a session, but you're only doing one set where you are reaching 100% muscular failure. And heck, you can even apply to select body parts. Say if it's a muscle that's not of highest importance to you, or you're simply trying to maintain it, or you seem to grow fine regardless. So you don't see this need to add more volume. It goes back to, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And if eight sets a week for X area is causing great gains, then you don't have to necessarily jack it up to 10, even though that probably would pay off more in the long run. Anyway, I'm kind of rambling all over the place with this point, and it is the least important of this video because I don't even recommend training this way, but all this to say, if for some areas you want to use lower volume, then just creep up the intensity. And with that said, I got nothing more to say. I hope you enjoyed this little segment. Now I want to hear your feedback on the subject. Do you train to failure? What has your experience been like? Let's hear it, and I'll talk to you all next time.